sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. We have very little idea, Father, of your greatness and grace. But we come to you boldly in the name of Christ and ask that this marvelous availability may be made known to us tonight. We pray that you will bring home to speaker and listener alike the recognition that you are willing for us to seek you and find you. So draw near to us as we draw near to you. Open your word to us, we pray. Give us attentive minds and hearts ready to be stirred by it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we'll turn tonight to Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, where we've just been reading. And it will, I think, help me, though it is not absolutely essential, if you have your Bible open. Acts 17 verse 16, that's going to be our key verse tonight. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, we're going to spend two Sunday evenings in Athens, despite the fact that it's the end of the holiday season, and despite the fact that when I spoke to someone just now, as instructed by Hugh, I met someone who's just returned from Athens, we are going to go back again. And we're going to do so as the best possible preparation for the work that God has for us all to do this autumn. There's a sense in which we're gathering together. We're looking forward to the autumn's work. The new associates are joining us tomorrow. That's a very exciting new chapter. Students and others will be coming back in three or four weeks' time. We need, therefore, to prepare ourselves and be prepared by God for what he proposes to do amongst us this autumn. And I'm going to spend these two nights in Athens with you. Tonight I'm going to look at the man himself, the Apostle Paul. And next Sunday I'm going to look with you at his message. We might put it a slightly different way. I think this gets really to where I want to go. Tonight I'm going to look at the heart of Paul as a Christian worker. I want to look at the heart of a Christian servant of God. And then next Sunday night I want to look at the heart of the authentic Christian message that it's our responsibility to proclaim and teach to those who come newly to London this autumn. Now, I've been brooding on this great chapter, actually, in the last week or so in my own reading. I've been thinking about its application. I was actually thinking about its application when I was sitting twiddling my thumbs and doing nothing on a German train on Friday and I had nothing to write on when it suddenly occurred to me that there were at least three practical applications of what I was going to take with you tonight. So as German railways had thrust into my hands a booklet about the excellence of their service, which I could already see, but the book I was unable to read because I don't know a single word except Eins, zwei, drei. I had a German governess when I was small. That's all she managed to teach me. Where were we? I wrote... (laughs) That's complete irrelevance, I'm sorry. Uh, We don't come here to hear my reminiscences. I wrote immediately on this piece of yellow paper and tore it out and brought it home, three practical applications for tonight. The first concerns, and we shall see this from our passage today, how differently you see things when you're converted. Many people have begun with Christ in the last 12 months. It's been a very exciting last year, really. And no doubt, as you've been away, perhaps some of you for a fairly long time on holiday, you've discovered again how differently one sees things when one becomes a true member of the family of God. I want to look at that tonight. A second practical question and application that comes from this that I read down as I was speeding along is what makes someone into a worker? rather than a drone. There are lots of Christian drones in the Church of God throughout the world, and not least in this country. As James said just now, we don't really like hard work. What turns a Christian from being a slug into a beaver? 
What makes us get up and try to do something while we have the opportunity? That's a practical application that we'll see from this passage. And then thirdly, a question that I gained really from some tapes I was hearing during a, a week off from the London Institute on some of these central chapters of Acts. The question was asked in this particular lecture and discussed, I think, by those who came to the lecture, how are we going to evangelize our great cities today? Because, of course, our great cities today are the places that have got to be evangelized. The old-fashioned missionary literature still tends to major on the jungle and so on. But actually, most people today live in cities, and we've got to wake up to it. 45% apparently of the people in the world live in cities. In Mexico, it's nearer 55%. And in cities like Mexico, so these statistics were given at the lecture, which is, uh, I think, the biggest city in the world, by 2000 AD, and incidentally, there will be people probably here in church tonight who may still be having things to do with St. Helens in uh, 12 years' time. It's not very long. By that time, Mexico City will be 40 million strong. And many other cities in Latin America are growing at the same rate. If you're an Australian, 72% of your fellow countrymen live in a town of 100,000 or more. By the year 2000, in other words, the, the uh, setup for which the Church of England uh, invented the parochial system, the agrarian village community of many centuries ago, will all but have disappeared in the Western world and will be even uh, disappearing in Africa. Most people will have made their way to cities, even if they're, they're unemployed. That's where they'll be living, and that's where they'll have to be evangelized if they're ever to be evangelized at all. How are we going to do it? Can we learn from Athens? Well, yes, I think we can. Now, the key sentence for us tonight is the sentence in 16 and 17. I'm not actually going to go, go very far from these first verses, 16, 17, 18. Indeed, I'm not going to go very far from verse 16, where we read of Paul that as he came to Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. There are a number of translations for this word, which I'm going to come on to later on. His spirit was stirred within him. I think that's the old authorized version. He was greatly distressed. A modern commentator, a very good commentator, translates it in this way. As I say, I'll come back to the meaning of the original word a little later. But the key sentence tonight is that he was greatly stirred in Athens. I want to look at only two things with you this evening. First, I want to look back and see what stirred him. And then I want to look forward and see what he actually did about it because it is the mark of being stirred sentimentally that we do nothing about it. A very dangerous thing today, by the way, in our television age. We sit in front of the box. We've probably done more than is good for us on holiday. We have every conceivable ghastly uh, tragedy put on the news. We have uh, famines and all that. Coming across our retina just for a moment, our feelings are engaged, and then, of course, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it, and we go straight off to something else. That's a very great danger of our present modern way of life. Our feelings are stirred in a number of ways to be indignant or compassionate, but there's not much we can do about it. The world is in such a mess, what can I do? So we're going to look back to see what stirred him, and then we're going to look forward to see what he actually did as a result of being stirred. So first then, we look back, and I ask the question and try to answer it from this, what caused Paul's heart to be stirred? Now, I ask that question not simply in an academic spirit, because tonight I want my heart to be stirred, and I want your heart to be stirred. Uh, in order to do that, I'm not going to uh, call upon the musicians to sing us lots of choruses. We're not going to sing a repetitive chorus for 40 minutes and repeat the chorus 35 times until we're all a sort of kind of squish. That is a prostitution, isn't it, of how people are stirred up today. It's a short, uh, a short corner, short cut, if you like, which we should not take. If we are to be stirred, we've got to be stirred the same way as the New Testament Christians were stirred. And it wasn't that method. Verse 16 tells us that Paul was stirred 
because of what, and the verb is quite plain, isn't it, in verse 16, what he saw. He saw things in actual concrete in front of his eyes. He saw things in Athens that stirred him to the very depth. Now let's recapture uh, uh, the journey of Paul. It's the second missionary journey. I hope the missionary journeys were not spoiled for you as they were for me as a youngster at school. I think it's what we did for scripture. And I remember how deadly dull it was. And so it was because though I can't remember even the name or the face of the teacher, I suspect that they were not Christian. And therefore to go in uh, telling us about the journeys of Paul if we're not Christian, of course, can only be deadly boring. But once you become a Christian, they're marvelous journeys. This is the second journey that ought to stir everybody's heart because it's the journey when, in chapter 16, verse 10, Paul had a vision from Macedonia calling him to come and help, Macedonia being modern Greece, verse 10 of chapter 16. That means he left Asia for the European mainland. Now that's a stirring moment, isn't it? This is the first time that the gospel comes to the continent in which we live. We are Europeans. Here is the gospel coming into Europe, to use the modern phrase. And in chapter 17, into Europe, we find that Paul is in Thessalonica, chapter 17, verse 6. Uh, and there, there's trouble. They uh, drag Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, crying out, these men have turned the world upside down and have come here to do the same thing. Rather striking little phrase. It's become a very famous phrase, of course. Here's the first time I think it's used in the Acts of the Christians that in coming to Europe, they turned the world upside down. So very quickly, and uh, Paul is spirited away by his Christian brethren, uh, and they take him down by night to Berea in verse 10. He starts again courageously in the synagogue, verse 10, and very strikingly, the Jews are different here than they are in Thessalonica and nearly every other place in the Acts, for they receive the word with all eagerness, examining the Bible daily to see if these things are so. Uh, this marked the Jews in Berea out. They listened to this revolutionary fulfillment of prophecy, this extraordinary rabbi become a Christian, and instead of throwing him out of the city and out of the synagogue, they looked at their scriptures and they said, well, we'll check it up to see if what you say is right. They had a noble spirit. However, alas, people from Thessalonica came down, verse 13, to make trouble in Berea, and so the brethren immediately, verse 14, sent Paul off on his way to the sea. It seems, therefore, although some commentators think that this was a blind and he really won't ever learn, that really doesn't matter to us tonight, it seems that he came down to Athens from the north, either overland or by sea, and arrived there on his own, telling the brethren who brought him down there to go back to Berea and get Silas and Timothy to come down to him, verse 14, 15, 16. So here he is then on his great journey, which he meant actually to finish at Rome, but God had other purposes. By the way, his journeys are in a marvelous mixture of strategic planning and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's leading. I want to commend that balance to you. I haven't time to talk about it now, but many of you are thinking hard about guidance. You will find that the Apostle Paul was a great planner, but was also very sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. Uh, I think there is no doubt that when he came into Europe, he was wanting to come down into Italy and down to the center of the world, Rome. But he wasn't allowed to do that. He's deflected down to Athens, and then in chapter 18, verse 11, no time to look at it now, he goes to Corinth and spends 18 months there. And then with a little hiccup, he goes to Ephesus, chapter 20, verse 31, he spends three years there. I just mention that because you might get the impression from a casual reading that Paul's travels were rather like a modern evangelist staying in a place for a week. Actually, his greatest work was done when he stayed for 18 months in Corinth and three years in Ephesus. He often stayed a very, very long time. And he did that in response to the obvious providential leading of the Holy Spirit. I, I say that also to show that he had, as far as we can see, no plan to start anything in Athens. He is here simply in order to get safe to be preserved from the Jewish attackers and he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to come presumably they'll then have a staff meeting and decide what next to do
So here he is on Athens alone, which is not Paul. Paul was very much a team man. He doesn't seem to have liked being on his own. He seldom worked on his own. He always worked surrounded by a very large team. He valued the team, and he was never without that kind of help. So here he is rather unusually on his own in Athens, and we're told he is stirred to the depth. Now, many writers have made a lot of the fact, of course, that he's not stirred to the depths by the things that you might expect. Uh, Paul was a Roman citizen. He would be welcome in Athens, of course. Uh, the Greeks had fallen to the Roman emperor long before this. The Romans were very proud of Greece. They used to go there on holiday and show off uh, to their friends about this marvelous place that they'd captured and all the great things that they'd discovered there. And I don't need to tell you that uh, Greece was the cradle of uh, Western democracy, as we like to call it. It is the cradle of philosophy. Uh, Paul, uh, however, is not apparently stirred by the fact that he's arrived in this great cra cradle of civilization. Nothing is said about that at all. What is said, because Luke wants, keeps his eye on the ball, is that he is stirred by the sight of a city full of idols, smothered in idols. I, I quite like that verb, saw, because at least he could see them. Uh, now, the city of Athens is three million strong, and most of the air a smog or a haze lies across it. But when Paul arrived there, the uh, light that Homer first celebrated, the marvelous crystal light that you get in a holiday in Greece that is so famous with a crystal-like quality, that light, of course, would have been... Uh, uh, enjoyed in Athens as well only 10,000 people probably living there then and so through that lovely clear light I don't know why the Greeks never produced impressionist painters they ought to have done oughtn't they but that marvelous light but that clear light he comes into Athens and there's a comparatively small city with these monuments everywhere and he can see them all and is stirred to the depths the cheapest guidebook that you can buy, I bought this just to see, tells us on page 12 that uh, the youngest Greek boy or girl can reel off the names and particulars of the family of 12 top deities of Mount Olympus. It's on like the top 10 records. Zeus, Hera, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Hermes, uh, Aphrodite, Poseidon, Hestia, and so on and many more, Jupiter, Neptune, many of these great gods, many of them knocked about in previous wars, but there are their marvelous temples, uh, there are their wonderful statues, and uh, that can be seen, of course, by the wanderer and tourist in Greece today. Now, preachers, at this particular point, and I've listened to some preachers on Acts, and I've read some uh, sermons and commentators, they all say how different Paul was from the modern tourist. He saw idols, and we would have seen marvelous temples and treasures. I'm not sure that that's quite fair. If we had been tourists with our cameras slung round our tummies and uh, our pack on our back, or whatever it is that you like to travel, and you had gone to Greece in the days of the Apostle Paul, you would have been struck in exactly the same way as he was you would have been struck by the many gods of Greece. Because, of course, these temples and all these things were in active use every day. You would have been absolutely astonished. It was said in those days it was easier to find a god than a man up in his street. If there had been these deplorable weekend supplements uh, with travel uh, things that we all have now told us even at this, are you planning next summer's holiday already? Uh, according to the supplements you ought to be you know the kind of article that would be in the uh, supplement on Greece on Athens would be the many gods of Greece, a surprise holiday, or the strange city where philosophy and religion meet, but it was strange wasn't it? because in our modern world if you've got philosophers you haven't got religion, look at London University Founded on a pagan basis because it was founded by philosophers. Sydney University the same. York University the same. Where you've got philosophers, you usually haven't got religion and vice versa. Here was a city full of philosophers and full of religious talk. Now, I don't think that Paul was a Philistine. 
I think he must uh, have known, like anybody else, how beautiful many of these things were. Uh, the tourist guide will have been lyrical with you about the Parthenon, and no wonder. It's the most amazing building. I have no architectural gifts, but it is, I, I can remember vividly being told that no single line is straight. Do you remember on holiday being told that? The, these amazing uh, pillars that bulge in the middle, they are not aware of it, that all lean inward a little. It is one of the great architectural works of genius. And anybody can see that, even though they are a Philistine today. Paul would have been perfectly well of that. And those great statues, the Greeks are the very first people. Uh, and it took them a hundred years or so, but they suddenly arrived at the time when they, unlike anybody else in the ancient world, or really since, was able to make a human figure in stone or metal that looked like flesh. It was a very, very great artistic achievement. They were the people who did it. And Paul would have seen that. So I assume that he must have been amazed at these things. But you see, what Luke wants us to know here is that what he saw was on a deeper level than that. There was much to catch the eye. But what he saw was something deeper than that. He saw this terrible spiritual degradation. Turn back to Mark chapter 6, verse 33 for a very, very good comparison of this same thing, which goes right the way through the New Testament. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 33. Here is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples going to have, it's a very rare thing in the Gospels, which move at hectic pace, going to have a day off, verse 31. Associates, please take note, you're meant to have a day off. And they go to a lonely place, verse 32. But many people saw where they're going and run on ahead of them and get there first. And then that wonderful verse, one of the great verses, I think, in Mark's Gospel, verse 34. Jesus went ashore and saw a great throng, and it says he had pity on them, compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them. Now, what Mark is telling you there is that Jesus saw in them something that nobody else saw. If you'd ask the ordinary uh, religious leader of our Lord's day what he saw, he'd have said he saw a great crowd of people who were mostly Jewish people and no doubt regular uh, members of the uh, synagogue and so on. But what Jesus saw was sheep without a shepherd. I remember a boy saying to me, soon after he'd been converted, he was playing a game and on the playing field, he suddenly realized that all the other people he was playing the game with had no knowledge of this marvelous marvelous truth that he'd learned the holidays before and that they were perishing. Extraordinary thing to think in the middle of a game, isn't it? That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. What happens if a sheep hasn't got a shepherd? Well, of course, it perishes. Especially in that world, with wolves and so on. So what Jesus does as he comes away and sees this great crowd is he sees deeply into the reality there and sees people without any hope. Now, I hope that since you've been converted to Christ, that you begin to see people like that. I'm sure in your work you do. It may be that you're busy uh, delivering a baby or binding up something in casualty or doing whatever you have to do, filling in a form or whatever you have to do in your work. And uh, you're talking to someone and you suddenly comes over you, the person you're talking to, has got really great needs that only Christ can meet. And only in the last year or two you've understood that yourself. Now, when you're converted to Christ, you begin to realize how many lonely people there are in the world. How many empty people, how many embittered people, nowhere to turn, purposeless, destructive. Your eyes are open to it. I would very much hope that your eyes were open to it if you were abroad on holiday this summer. If your eyes weren't open to the spiritual need of people in Europe, for example, Europe is in very great spiritual need. It's largely formality, isn't it? In Germany, I was very conscious of this. Indeed, if you don't feel any compassion, if you don't feel the spiritual need of people where you've been, if you've been abroad, I would wonder if you were a Christian. I really would. 
course, it's not just people, you know. It also happens with quite ordinary things like buildings. I remember when first uh, this, we started to use this building as a, as a living church, and um, we had to have a committee, I've forgotten where they came from, to investigate various alterations we wanted to make, especially to do with the building of the rectory and the offices and the boilers and so on. And... Um, we had a group whose job it was to look after the environment. It was very interesting to me that they could only see this building in terms of an early English building that had to be preserved. You see, that's, that's how they saw it. It's not actually a very distinguished building. You've got into Suffolk or Norfolk and you'll find many far greater early English buildings. But because of the Great Fire, it's the only large one left in London. Early English. So you see, these people came, very rightly, that was their job to do that, but they could not see further than that this was an early English building that had to be protected. But we saw, with the eyes of those who were trying to proclaim the Christian faith to others, that this building had got to be used by modern people in a modern way. Now that's a Christian insight. There are many people who have to do with the church who haven't got further than seeing beautiful buildings. Maybe, I don't think it's a particularly beautiful building, but it's quite an interesting one. But you see, there are much, much more important things that go on here than showing a tourist around and explaining why that hole there is in the wall. By the way, if you find out, do tell me, because nobody knows. <laughs> I was talking to a young GP this morning, not here, quite a long way away from here, actually, and he, came, he asked me to come and speak at the opening of a new surgery, a great new building that they're, they're doing in this particular town, and it is a Christian practice, and he said, uh, we have been very stimulated by a number of other Christian practices where they are trying to go further than just the basic medicine that people come to us for because we see so many of the deeper hurts of people when they come to us. Apparently they'd been to a number of practices, they'd found good bookstalls and all sorts of things dealing with many of the hurts of human beings. They wanted to do the same and they wanted to have a service sometime over Christmas or the New Year when this thing was opened, when the mayor and corporation were present and so on and they nailed their colors to the mast and they said in effect, we are here to be good doctors but we also see that deeper in the heart of men there are needs that we can't touch and we want them to be touched. Isn't that a fine thing to say? But only a Christian can talk like that. I'm sure the mayor will be completely bewildered. When you put your piece of elastoplast on, you've done your job. But of course you haven't. So Paul was stirred. He saw spiritual dereliction in this most beautiful city. He saw ignorance of God in this great city of philosophers. He saw idolatry in the city of religion and temples. He saw bankruptcy, and he stirred to the depths. Now, I'm going to come back to that word because I haven't told you yet what it means. I'm going to keep that until the end. I want to stop there at the first point and go on to my second point and say where that stirring led. But at least let us accept this first point that the apostle comes to Athens, he's there on his own, and he's stirred to the depth by what he sees. And what he sees is a very great spiritual need. Precisely what that is, I'll explain later. Now, this drives him to astonishing activity. As I say, I don't actually believe now, the longer I've stu more, more I've studied this, that he ever envisaged staying here for very long, nor do I believe it was his practice to act unilaterally on his own. He seems always to have done so with others, usually one special partner like Timothy or Silas or Titus or someone. But in this case, he is galvanized into action. And what he does may help us to see how our cities at in the last part of the 20th century are going to be evangelized. And so I want you to watch this very carefully. This may be more important for you when you leave St. Helens than it is now. Though, frankly, I think it's very important for every one of you who is a Christian now. Because you notice in these two or three verses, we're told that Paul went to three groups of people who are totally different. First, we're told that he went into the synagogue, 17a, where there were Jews and the devout persons. 
That's where he always went first in any town. He went straight to the synagogue and reasoned there with the Jewish people from their Old Testament scriptures pointing them to Christ. The devout persons means the God-fearers and refers to pagans and Gentiles who had been attracted by the purity of Jewish life, particularly, particularly incidentally the purity of their family life, that has always made a very great impression to people in pagan worlds with Jewish family life, and it did then, just as our Christian family life ought to attract people. So there were many people coming to the synagogue who were not full members, who did not have Jewish privileges, but were out there on the fringe listening to what was going on. The synagogue, therefore, stands, I think, symbolically for the church today, where there are lots of people who come, who sit at the edge, so to speak, and listen to it and say what's going on. Now, let's get it clear. That's going to happen this autumn. Many people are going to come into St. Helens on Tuesday and on Sunday and at other times, and they're going to sit in a large crowd of people. They may or may not be Christians. They may be nominal. They may think themselves to be Christians, but not be Christians. And it is our job to use the church to reach those people. Not to be so taken up with our own concerns as Christians, not just chatting away amongst ourselves, but aware of the fact that there are many people here, you might call them God-fearers, who want to hear what ha we have to say. Now that's a fairly obvious first step in evangelizing our great cities. If the church gives an uncertain noise, then what will become of the world? I turned on the television earlier this morning to see what the service was, and the service was at some uh, cathedral in Wales, and the first five minutes I didn't have time to, want, uh, to listen to anymore, and I didn't want to, was some people leaping about dancing outside. Well, I knew nothing serious was going on. See, if people come, they've got to know that something serious is going on. And if they go to the vast majority of the churches in this country, they will get no such idea, will they? There will either be a tiny number of people, or they will go inside and see that there is nothing here except that which belongs to, so to speak, in talk. God forbid that it should be true here. The first thing that has to be evangelized is the church. Now, secondly, the next stage. He argued in the synagogue, 17b, and in the marketplace, the Agora, every day with those who chanced to be there. Now, some of you will have seen the Agora when you went to Athens on your holiday. Uh, I'll just uh, read, if I can quickly find it here, the description of the Agora because it is so striking and it puts it more quickly than I can possibly put it. Today, only rubble and foundations, well, actually, that's not quite true. Not only rubble and foundations, but cellars of sponges and all sorts of people are there. But today, only rubble and foundation remain of the marble or stone altars, temples, law courts, state offices, public archives, shops, concert hall, dance floor, gymnasium that stood there. And there is, in fact, a panoramic uh, representation of that for the visitor today to see it. Now, this agora to the northwest of the uh, Acropolis is, of course, still marked out today, and that was the center of Athenian life. Everybody was there, from the town clerk to the person about their shopping. And he moved there, you notice, and talked to those who chanced to be there and reasoned with them. By the way, the word argued there, the word reasoned, is simply his word for preaching preaching in public and in, uh, uh, on, on the marketplace. And I don't think by preaching in the marketplace he stood there with a the megaphone. I think he talked to whoever who would come up to him and reasoned with them face to face. It was courageous to go into the synagogue because, as you know, the Jews were often uh, very antagonistic to the Christian message. It was courageous to do this in the marketplace. And you'll notice that he not only met the stallholders, but Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were there, and they were very contemptuous and said, what would this babbler say? Well, if you want to know what a babbler is, I'm a babbler. Uh, a babbler literally means the Greek word a seed picker. It was used of the bird that goes along picking up its odd bits of seed or a worm here or there. It, uh, it will refer, therefore, to that old word for an urchin in our language, a gutter snipe. That is, a, uh, a child, like a, a bird, 
picking up at peg ends wherever it can find to feed or to sell. It's a, lang- it's a word in all languages, isn't it? Something like that. And uh, I'm a bird picker, that is to say, to prepare for this. I go and peck in every commentary I can and get what I can for you. There's nothing original in this sermon at all. So the Epicureans and the Stoics would simply have said, this man, Lucas, is uh, a bird picker, seed picker. He hasn't got an original thought in his head, and they would be absolutely right. My job is not to give you original thoughts, but to tell you what is in this book. Now, thirdly, look where he went. Uh, these people got hold of him, apparently, not in an unfriendly way, as some writers have thought, as though he was taken for trial. He went to the Areopagus, which was the name of the hill, and then the court that originally met on that hill. Probably the court no longer met on that hill when Paul was there. Today, incidentally, the Supreme Court in Athens is still called the Areopagus. And though the Romans had taken away a great deal of their power, they still were responsible for the religious uh, activities of the city. And probably, therefore, they were able to give a license or refuse one to Paul to go on speaking. And so there is the possibility that they didn't give Paul a license, having heard him. And they say, we want to hear what you've got to say. You bring strange things to our ears, verse 20 because they love hearing and telling new things, verse 21, and so he stands in the midst of them and tells them what he's seen. And before we go on any further, just look what he tells them he's seen. Verse 22, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious, for as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, I found an altar to this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. I came to the city, I see you're very religious, and there is the the flavor in the word of superstitious there's iron in it uh, he's not being rude but he's being very blunt he said I see an altar to an unknown God and that seems to me to characterize you men and therefore I propose to tell you about the true God that's courage isn't it breathtaking courage almost cheek goes to these learned men and he says I see that you know nothing about God, I propose to tell you about him. What stands for the Areopagus today? I was trying to think of this. I'm not sure that I know, really. Uh, It's to go, isn't it, to those areas of life where Christ is not known? Is it to go to the religious councils of the Muslims, the Hindus? No, I don't think it's that, because uh, those people, of course, are not discussing things that are new, but that are old. I'm not quite sure where it is. Perhaps it's the university. But it's to go to places where people are prepared to listen, but at the moment are ignorant of the things of God, the modern agnostic, and reason with them and give them an account of your faith. Now, will you look at those three places? It's very interesting, isn't it? In the church, I am to give an account of the scriptures about Jesus Christ, because there will be many there who don't understand. Then I'm to go out to the agora, to the marketplace. That means that if you're a member of a Christian union, there should be some meeting, which is not just a meeting of the Christians enjoying uh, fellowship and worship and the word of God, but there should be a meeting somewhere available for people just to be spoken to about the things of God, people who pass by, some marketplace, so to speak. Talking about a marketplace, turn back with me to Proverbs for a moment, and this gives you the feeling of what I'm getting at, I think, very well. Proverbs chapter uh, 1 and 1. I love this, this verse. Proverbs 1, verse 20, page uh, 559. Proverbs 1, verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market she raises her voice. Verse 21 of Proverbs 1. On the top of the wall she cries out, at the entrance of the city gate she speaks, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? Isn't that splendid? You see what the writer of the Proverbs is saying to us? That's where God's word should be heard. Not just on Sundays in church, but in the marketplace. And we should be in the marketplace saying, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? Turn over to chapter 8, verse 1. 
Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way in the power she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town at the entrance of the portal she cries aloud, To you, O men, I call, and my cries to the sons of men. Now we're going to be doing that in a new way this autumn on Thursdays. Some of you will know that every Tuesday we have a service here for business people, city workers, and they crowd in here. I'm thankful to say it still goes strong. This is the Agora. This is the marketplace for shipping, for uh, insurance, for banking, and so on. And many of them hear the gospel, and some respond to it. But we feel that we're not reaching the people from 17 through 25, and Hugh is starting a new meeting. I think it's called Channel 5, but I've forgotten, and I forgot to... Uh, Hugh, where are you? Oh, you have, you've gone. What's it called? Channel 5, I've got it right. And that's going to be at St. Andrews, uh, and maybe if the people don't come to St. Andrews, the meeting will have to go to them. Pray for it, will you? Very important. Because what does wisdom do? It cries out in the marketplace. And then the Areopagus, whatever that may mean. Very interesting, isn't it? The Areopagus was a place of great learning and dilettante intellectualism. But uh, in fact, Paul, but we'll leave this till next week, went straight to the mark. It reminds me of a very famous preacher of uh, this century who went to an Oxford college. This is a true story. And no sooner had he finished his sermon than the principal's wife or the warden's wife or whatever she was called, uh, ran out of her stall up to the preacher. She said, the most remarkable thing has happened today. She said, you are the very first preacher who's ever been to this chapel, or my husband has been the master of this college, who has spoken to us as though we were sinners. She said, it seems obviously clear that most preachers who come and preach in this chapel try to give us some great intellectual insight. It's clear that many of them are not great intellects, but they feel that's the only way to reach us. But you have Talk to us as sinners, and that's exactly what we need. And that's exactly what Paul did, perhaps not with quite such a positive response to the Areopagus. Now, I want to finish. What led him to do these very courageous things? Oh, by the way, they were not just courageous, they were competent, weren't they? It's no good having boldness and courage. The church hasn't got much of that today. But it's no good having courage if I haven't got competence. I've actually got to be skilled enough to reach the people I'm going to. Am I skilled enough to the, talk to the people in the synagogue? Read, Mark, Learn. Fellowship group. DC. That's where I've got to start. Great deal of skill is needed. Secondly, am I skilled enough to talk to them in the uh, Agora. It's no good being like the uh, open-air preacher. That famous story uh, of Threadbare, I'm afraid, but nonetheless uh, needs repeating. Uh, somebody looked over his notes and his pad that was in his hands and saw alongside uh, the notes that he was preaching from, argument weak here, shout louder. That's no good, is it? There's been a lot of Christian preaching like that. If I go into the marketplace, it's a good shouting. I shall only be regarded as an idiot. Mind you, they shout enough in the uh, metal market and the um, the shipping market. And the, as for the futures market, the din is indescribable. However, I can assure you that if you do that for Christ, they won't take it very kindly. Now, you've got to be competent as well as courageous. And as for the Areopagus, if you're going to go to the senior common room, if you're going to go to very learned philosophers and defend Christ, you'll need courage, but you'll need competence too. We'll see next week how he had it. Why was it? Well, we come back then as we finish to our word. And I think the Revised Standard Version has translated the word correctly, though I don't believe this translation will bring out for you the exact meaning of it. His spirit was provoked. It's a very, very sharp word in the Greek. The Greek word is the one from which we get paroxysm. You know, somebody says, if you talk like that, you'll give me a heart attack. It's that kind of sharp response. Now, I don't think that helps us very much. In what sense was he sharply caught, so to speak, in the heart. I don't think we shall find the answer in the New Testament. 
We have to go back to the Old Testament that is often the best commentary on the New Testament, where we find that this word provoked is used a number of times of God, and I'm going to give you two. And uh, I'm going to leave these two with you tonight because I think they're very, very important. I wish, in a sense, I didn't have to give them to you. It has been the surprise to me in preparing this week. See, I would like to have said to you, rather like Mark 6, that when Christ looks out over the crowd, and we do this, this, this autumn, that in our hearts there should be the love of God to people and we should have compassion upon them that they may have the privileges that we have had by God's grace. But uh, there's another side of God. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 7. Deuteronomy 9 7, page 163. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was angry that he was ready to destroy you. And he goes on saying that throughout that chapter. Angry and indignant with his people because of their rebellion and ready to destroy them. One more reference. Isaiah 65, verse 2, read to us just now by Helen. It's our last reference, but a very important one. Please turn it up. Isaiah 65, 2 and 3. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually. Now that actually is the word that is used in the New Testament for Paul as he stood alone in Athens. He was provoked as God is provoked by rebellion. That is, he did not treat himself as God. Paul didn't suffer from self-importance like that. But the sense that this was God's attitude towards these people gripped his own heart. You see, when the Holy Spirit dwells within us as Christians, he will bring within our heart and feeling some of the feelings that are in the heart of God. God loves mankind and seeks to meet their needs. We shall feel that love for people, people that we've never liked before in our lives. But there's another feeling here, which is a most unusual one, and I've never heard it preached on. Not in this way. But God is indignant. When God sees the ethnic religions of the world and their impurity, Hinduism, for example, God is indignant. When God sees the nominal church of Europe that no longer points people to Christ and uh, is given up to all sorts of things except evangelism, God is indignant. And when God looks upon Athens, that great city, the, the cradle of democracy, the cradle of philosophy, place of great learning, God is indignant that all this human wealth, all this human ability should result in absurd temples and idolatry. Now, why that is so hurtful to God, why it makes God's heart in heaven indignant, we shall see next week by the things that Paul says. But I believe that to be a very solemn thought. It's not one that I set out to bring to you tonight. I set out simply to study this chapter but I want to tell you that the heart of God yearns over those who are going to come to St. Helens this autumn because God is love, but God is also indignant. Indignant, I think, for example, in the city that we have here in the city of London so many hundreds of very able people whose idea of God wouldn't, wouldn't match the needs of a Sunday school. They know nothing. And if you talk to them about God, they say, oh, well, I like to think of God like this and say something utterly stupid. That makes God indignant and rightly so. I wonder if you've ever been stirred by that. I was so thankful for some of the sermons that uh, Mervyn gave on the Lord's Prayer. A tremendous sentence, hallowed be thy name. Have you ever been indignant? 
that God's name is not hallowed in your office or school where you teach, what does the name of God mean? Nothing. What does the name of Christ mean? Nothing. God is indignant and we too should be stirred by it. Let's pray. Gracious God, we have to confess that we're not indignant, that we're largely unfeeling and complacent. And we confess that. And we ask that you will stir our hearts, not only with your love, but also with a sense of the rightness of this divine indignation. And that we may be consumed with a desire to warn people of the danger in which they are living, as Paul was. Wake us up, therefore. Grant that in this place at St. Helens, grant that in our Christian unions, grant that in our fellowship groups we may take your name and your work seriously. We ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.